Hi, I'm Keith Kruger. I'm the spiritual development pastor here at Shoreline Community Church. Spiritual life is what's going on with, with our souls. It's what's going on inside us. As It's not a visible thing necessarily, although the uh, implications can have physical results. As we see ourselves serving, we know that we are growing spiritually. It's really God developing us on the inside. It's him changing what our priorities are. It's us becoming more in tune with God and his will for our lives. Your spiritual life is really all about what God has done inside you. First and foremost, I have to say, we need to pursue God. And, and that's done in multiple different ways. And, and the first way to do that is, is through reading the Bible. Uh, I would say that if you want to grow spiritually, if you want to see your spiritual life change, spend daily time in God's Word. The second tip really goes along with the first, and it's prayer. We hear from God through the word and we hear from God through prayer and having a relationship with God is about having conversations with him it's about sharing with him what's going on inside us even though he knows already there's something about us being able to express that to him that that helps us grow tip number three is uh, grow in your spiritual life uh, through group settings here at Shoreline Church we have our Sunday morning and Monday night Options. We have our monthly night of worship. We have Bible studies. We have growth groups. And, and we have multiple classes as well. We, we have some Bible studies where you can just show up and the material is presented to you that day. And it really helps you get a, a firmer understanding of the Bible. And then we have Bible studies such as precept upon precept. This gives you about four hours of homework a week. This is an in-depth, inductive Bible study where you really dig into the Word. You're not getting other people's interpretations of what the Bible says, but you're getting it for yourself. You're really learning how to learn how to study the Bible. It's a great process for you to go through. We have our new believers classes. We have baptism class. We have uh, spiritual gifts class. We've got one of those coming up on February 21st. This is an opportunity to, to look at how God has designed you. Once a month, we've got our night of worship. It's a Wednesday night service where we, we spend some more time singing to God. We have a, a, a deep teaching that really can apply to our lives. It's just another opportunity for you to grow in your spiritual life. So around here, we have plenty of opportunities. And I want to encourage you to take some of them and help yourself grow and truly get a grip on your spiritual life. Honey, um, I'm worried about Billy. I mean, all the other kids his age are walking. And some of the kids are running. And Billy's not even interested in standing up. And this little red light goes off on the dashboard of your family life and you go, something's not right. And you do something about it. You try to figure it out. You notice something's not right. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Rodriguez uh, Maria is a beautiful little girl, but uh, her weight and her height are below not just the average, but below the bottom of the scale, the last three checkups. I, I think we need to do some more tests. And the light goes on, on the health dashboard of life. And you notice, you notice it. You notice it. Hey, hey Bob, uh, I'm worried about my son, Robert. Uh, he plays a lot of video games. He stays in his room a lot. I think by now he should have a job. And, you know, I think by now he should be probably living out of the house. Well, how old is Robert now? Well, we just had his birthday last week. He's 40. <laughs> um, the lights hit your dashboard. You know, you, you know we, we, we notice things, right? I mean, you, there's things that you see that tell you how things are going. You, you, there's, there's lights that go off that let you know something's not quite right. But what about our spiritual lives? How do you know how you're doing? What's on the dashboard of your spiritual life? I mean, you, know, you become a Christian. You come to a point where you, where you, you know, come to the cross and you confess your sins and you accept Jesus and you're in the family and then it's done, right? Now you're a Christian. That's it. You go to heaven someday, right? 
Well, right heaven, but that's not all there is to it. That's the beginning. In John chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to this religious leader, this educated, brilliant man named Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. But here's the deal about being born. It's the beginning of a journey of life. And that's true spiritually for you and for me. When you come to faith in Jesus, that's the start. When you confess your sins and receive Jesus, that's the beginning. And now it's a lifetime of journeying. And there should be indicators, lights that go off on the dashboard of our spiritual life, letting us know if something's wrong. Now, we're in week six of the six-week series called Getting a Grip. And we talked about getting a grip on your finances and getting a grip on your relationships and, and getting a grip on your health and all these different things. And we're talking now about getting a grip on your spiritual life. And in all these areas, we talked about those four constants, those four things that are always there. We use the word grip, G-R-I-P. Those four constants, number one, God. God is first in our lives. That's the G of grip. Number two, relationships are a close second. I mean, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So God first, relationship second. The I is our inner life. Now, how am I doing on the inside? Because you know what? It's not good enough to paint the, you know, the, the, the rotting, corroded barn with a new coat of paint and say, it's new again. You have to do some serious work on the inside, on the structure. So every area of our spiritual life and every area of our practical daily lives, God first, relationship second, and then the inner life. How am I doing on the inside? Is this authentic or am I just putting a coat of paint on something that's not authentic? And then the P, G-R-I-P, the P is practices. There's practices, there's behavior. If you want to get a grip on your financial life, there's some practices you put into place that'll help you a lot, right? If you want to get a grip on your physical health and your physical life, there's practices. That's true for all of these areas. And it's true for getting a grip on your spiritual life. We've got to be able to look at that dashboard and know if it's a green light, the tank is full, and you can just hit the gas and go, and you're heading forward. Or if, man, there's red lights flashing, you can't ignore them. You've got to notice them. So how do we know what those red lights are? How do we know what those areas are that we should be growing, naturally growing, to be having a grip on our spiritual lives? Well, we sat down for six months. We worked as a team with our children's pastor, with our middle school leader, our high school leader, and our adult spiritual development leader, and myself, for six months. And we walked through this book, and we studied the scriptures, and we said, what does God say are the signs, the indicators that we're growing spiritually? And I want to share those with you today. I've shared, I've shared them in different ways before, but I want to let you know that everything we do at Shoreline, everything hits one of these six markers, one of these six indicators, because we want you to be healthy spiritually. We don't want you just to become a Christian as a baby Christian, just stay there. We want you to move forward. So what are, what are those six indicators that we identified? And, and I'll tell you, it's nothing uh, new or radical in the sense that any church that really studies the Bible and wants to be the church, they're going to be trying to do these six things. We just have to put it in our own words and understand what it is. So I want you today to understand those six indicators. So here's what you can do. You can do a personal self-assessment. This isn't for you to look at somebody else and say, let me figure out how you're doing spiritually. This is for you to say, how am I doing? Are there red lights on the dashboard that I'm just ignoring? I should do something about those. I'll also let you know as we go through these six indicators, I won't go into depth on any of them in terms of explaining it all because that's what we do year-round at Shoreline. We look at these six areas and we create opportunities for you to grow and move forward in each of these six areas. So let's look at these and kind of in your own heart, how, what's on the dashboard of my life? How am I doing? Here's the first one. How do I know I'm getting a grip on my spiritual life? Number one, my character is becoming more and more like Jesus. My character, my inner person, and it changes everything I do on the outside. My desires, my likes, my dislikes, my character, my heart, how I see the world. All this is being changed by Jesus. It doesn't mean you become a Christian and you're radically changed in every part of your character and nothing's going to change. It's all, I'm all good. I'm set. It's a journey of walking with Jesus where he's changing your character. And the Apostle Paul, the person who wrote a large portion of the New Testament, Many times in the letters that he wrote, he would, he would, he would inspire by the Holy Spirit. He'd say, here's the kind of stuff that reflects sort of the, an attitude of the, of the flesh, of sinful practice. And, and if you, that's who you are on the inside and you live on the outside, it shows that are you really connecting with Jesus? And then he, he said, but now here's the things that are of the Spirit. Here's how you, how you live your life on the inside and then how you live it out on the outside. And so look with me at Galatians chapter 5, beginning of verse 19. 
In Galatians 5, it's one of those passages where the Apostle Paul says, you know, well, the flesh is like this, the spirit is like this. And he's really saying, which of these is kind of winning out in your life? And what's happening on the inside of you and impacting the outside? So Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, which is like kind of a hardcore party spirit. It's the party, 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 party spirit. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, self-ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. You know what and the like means? A bunch of other stuff. That's Paul's way of saying, you got the point. That kind of stuff, right? And the like. And then he says this, interesting line. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You go, whoa. If I do one of those things one time, I'm not going to heaven? That's not the point. We believe when somebody comes to the cross and accepts the grace of Jesus, they're, they're, they're his child. We belong to God through faith in Jesus. Well, then what's Paul talking about? I think what he's saying is this. If your life is marked by all that stuff and the like more, and there's no sense of it being wrong, and there's no sense of, you know, you don't, you don't care, you do whatever you want. I think what he's saying, he's asking the question, do you really know Jesus? I mean, is the Holy Spirit really inside of you? Because when God is inside of you, when you've really come to faith in Jesus, it starts to change you. And if all the indicator lights are blinking red and you don't care, he's saying something, do, do you really know? Are you headed for heaven? Do you, did you maybe just, I, well, I just kind of said a prayer one time, but I, did you really come to know Jesus? Did the Spirit of God move into you? And he says, because when God moves into you and the Spirit of God lives in you, you live a different kind of life. Your character, your attitudes, your behavior changes. So he says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit... When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit moves in you and starts to grow these things. The fruit of the Spirit, very different than the other list, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires... Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul is saying walk in step with the Spirit. Walk following the things that, that, that are the kind of character and lifestyle and behavior that honor God. So here's the getting a grip challenge. Honestly evaluate if the acts of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit are growing in your life as a lifestyle and not as a one-time exercise. Make it a lifestyle that you check your life and say, how am I doing? Now, let me be very clear about something, about all six of these indicators. I could tell you as your pastor that in all six of these indicators, at some point in the last probably five or ten years, all of those have been a bright light on the dashboard of my life. I don't perfect any of these things. I'm still learning and growing in faith. The question is, is my character and my outlook and my attitude and my thinking and my lifestyle looking more and more like the things of the flesh or like the things of the spirit? And the only person who can answer that question is you for your own life. So look at your own dashboard and say, you know, does this first list of stuff look more like me or the second list of stuff look more like me? And it's a journey. We're growing. We're learning. We're expanding in faith. But do you look more like Jesus than you did six months ago and two years ago? Is your character and your attitude more like Jesus or more like the stuff of the flesh? And that's a good way to just check yourself and look at that indicator. If you say, man, most of my behaviors and attitudes are kind of on that flesh, flesh side. You go, man, God, that's a blinking indicator. Help me live in a different way. Help me grow in the work of your spirit. We start with character on the inside. And then the second thing, how do I know I'm getting a grip of my spiritual life? I am learning and applying God's word to my life in increasing measure. More and more, this book is becoming part of my life. I'll tell you something as a pastor. I'll tell you something as a Christian. I became a Christian when I was 15, almost 16 years old. The single thing that has most impacted my spiritual growth and my life and making me more like Jesus and challenging me the most, the single greatest thing is this book. Opening this book every day. I try every day. I don't do it perfectly, but I try every day to open this book and to read what it has to say. It could be first thing in the morning when you wake up. I encourage you to find a place and a time and make it part of the rhythm of your life. 
It could be on your lunch break. It could be in the evening before you go to bed or right after dinner. Whatever works for you. But have a place and a time. And read what this book says. Listen to these words from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For all scripture is God-breathed, breathed by the Spirit of God. It's useful for teaching, we like that, rebuking, correcting, not sure if we like that, training in righteousness, that's a good one, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you want to be the person God wants you to be, read this book, study this book, dig into it, get a study Bible, read the footnotes, get a, you know, a good biblical commentary, just dig into God's word, sign up for a, you know, the new classes we have going on, just go to the Connection Center, and you about all kinds of classes happening, go deeper into this book. And, and that, I think that's critical for us. And so you look at the indicator, you know, the, the, the dashboard of your life, and you say, am I growing in my knowledge of the Bible, in my love for the Bible, and is it changing my life? So here's the question. Now, here's the getting grip challenge. Open God's word daily, read it, study it, and apply it to your life. You can say, well, that's easy. I mean, that's simple. You know, get the Bible, read the Bible, follow what it says. Easy. Well, it's easy to get the point. You gotta get the point, right? That's some, who would say you get the point? That's important, right? Nod your head. That's important. Who would say it's really easy to do? That's the challenge. But make it part of your lifestyle. We have a young, young adult in the church here that was telling me about how they start their day. So a while back, this, you know, this is how I start my day. I wake up, I grab my phone from my nightstand, and I have a bookmark with the shoreline page with our daily reading guide. We create a daily reading guide, a Bible reading guide for every day of the whole year, and the seven days of reading before today were all set to get you ready for today's message. We plan, it's not a coincidence, we plan that year round. So this young person gets their phone and they have a tab, so they hit it and it opens to our page that has our daily reading. And they're like, okay, it's Wednesday, day one, two, three, Click, they touch on Wednesday, and it opens the passage on their phone, because that's what it does. That's how it works. You touch it, opens the passage. And then they touch the little speaker up in the corner, and they set it down, and their phone reads the Bible passage for the day to them while they're laying in bed. How cool is that, right? What a world. You go, well, you have to read the Bible. Well, for this person, listening is easier. We're, we're in a culture now where more and more people learn by watching and listening, and less and less by reading. I'm still a big fan of reading, but you know what? If you say, I'm not comfortable reading or it doesn't work for me, then listen to God's word. But get it into your heart and say, what does it mean? How do I live it out? And say, how do I now change my life to be consistent with God's word? If you want to look at the indicator of your life and say how you're doing, say, am I growing to love the word of God? Am I reading it, listening to it, getting it into my mind regularly and trying to follow what it teaches? When the Holy Spirit speaks to me, am I living out what it says? Indicator number three. Prayer and worship are becoming more natural. More natural. You just pray more than you did before. You worship more passionately than you did before. When I became a Christian, I didn't like singing. I just didn't. And I became a Christian. And I, and I read in the Bible, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord, a new song. And it was just, you know, God was like beating me over the head with a sing to God. And I'd, I'd go to youth group and stuff when I was a young person. But I didn't want to sing. But I was also trying to follow, number two, what God's word says. <clears throat> so I started singing to God. And I can tell you, <clears throat> as the years go by, my, my, love for, my love for worship and song and my love for prayer is communicating with God. It's growing. It's taking time. Do you worship more passionately today than you did six months ago? Do you talk with God more naturally? In John chapter 17, this great chapter of the Bible, Jesus is praying. He starts praying in verse 1 of John 17, and his prayer ends the last verse of the chapter. The whole chapter is a prayer. He's praying for those who came to faith in him then, and how we would want, he prays for us, those who come in to faith through the ministry of the disciples, through history. So Jesus prays for you in John 17. If Jesus, who is God with us, needed to pray, guess who else needs to pray? What's the answer? I do. You do, right? So talk to God. And so, so here's, here, and John, John 17 begins with these words, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you, Jesus. And he goes on to pray for the church then, the church today. So here's the challenge. Talk with God at specific times and throughout your day. I think it's great to have specific times that you pray. Wake up in the morning before you get out of bed, even before you grab your phone and listen to your passage or whatever you want to do, just, and just say, God, Thank you for a new day. Let me just lay there for a minute. God, thank you for this day. God, help me through this day. 
God, I got a meeting coming up today that I just know it's going to be a tough meeting. Give me wisdom and patience. God, there's this thing coming up today that I'm excited about. Thank you for this opportunity. Would you lead me through that? And just talk to God like you talk to a friend. You know, I, I think praying at meals is a great time just to pause. Whether you pray out loud or just pray quietly in your own heart, whether you open your eyes or close your eyes, talk to God. When you go to bed at night, there's a rhythm of life. You know, when you wake up, when you go to bed, just pause and talk to God. But also all through the day, when something comes up, just talk to God about it. You know, I love the book of Nehemiah because all through Nehemiah, Nehemiah just starts praying. Conflict, pray. Great moments, pray. Building project, pray. Talk to the king, pray. You know, just, he just prayed. So all through your day, talk with God. Listen for his leading. And grow. How are you doing in this part of your life? Is your prayer communication with God and your worship of God and praise of him, is that growing more natural and more passionate? That's an indicator that you're kind of going green light. If you say, man, I just don't ever pray. And even when I come to church, I don't really want to worship. I don't want to say, God, maybe that's a flashing light. And again, I can't give you all the solutions now, but I'll tell you this. Throughout our entire church, from children's ministry to youth ministry through adults, the six things we're focusing on are these six things. Everything fits under one of these six areas. We want to help everyone grow in their faith. So how's my character? Is my character becoming more like Jesus? How's my passion for the Bible and living out the Bible? How's my communication with God in prayer and in worship? And then the fourth indicator is you look at sort of that, that dashboard of your life. How do I know I'm getting a grip on my spiritual life? Number four, I serve others more quickly and more joyfully. How do, how do I know I'm growing spiritually? You have a heart to serve. You want to serve people. And, and you just find yourself more quick to say, how can I help you? More quick to, be, to bring a blessing to someone. And you do it with joy. Not, oh, I, gotta, I, gotta do, I made this commitment. I got to do this thing. But I, mean, I get to do this thing. I get to serve Jesus. In John chapter 13, there's this, this amazing passage where Jesus is gathering with his disciples. He's right near the end of his life. He's about to go to the cross and die for our sins and take our punishment. and give us. He's about to die on the cross for us to pay for all of our wrongs. And he's gathering for this meal with his followers, this last supper. And in that culture at that time, when you came into a home, oftentimes there would be a servant who would wash feet at the door. They would just, they would, you know, feet were dirty, people wore sandals, dusty paths, and there'd be a servant to wash feet. But if there wasn't anyone there to wash feet, there'd normally be a bowl, a pitcher with water, a towel. And oftentimes the first guest to arrive would offer to wash the feet of the other guests. It's part of the tradition. It'd be like if you came to someone's house and it was raining out and everybody was wearing coats. And you go, oh, you start, oh, let me take your coat. I'll find a plate. And you start hanging up coats in the closet, just you know, helping out. Well, here's Jesus and his disciples. They're sitting around the table and all their feet are dirty because nobody offered to wash each other's feet. So Jesus gets up from the meal, pours the water in the basin, gets the towel, and one by one, he washes all of their feet, this humble service. And after he washes all of his disciples' feet, he comes back to the table and he says these words. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Now, he's not saying to literally physically wash feet. He's saying, serve each other. Be servants. I have set you an example, Jesus says, that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now watch this. Now that you know these things, you got the service message. Now that you know these things, what does he say? You will be blessed. What does it say? If you do them. Jesus, I know you get it. I just washed your feet. I know you saw that. I know you get the message. You're supposed to do the same. I'm telling you this, Jesus says, the blessing comes when you start to do it. So how's your life of service? Do you serve more quickly, more passionately? more joyfully than you did six months ago or a year ago. Here's our getting a grip challenge. Commit to serve generously and regularly with words, resources, and in a ministry. I want to challenge you to say, I want to serve people with words that I bless with my words, I encourage with my words. That's a way to serve people. Say, I want to serve with my resources. God, what I have is a gift from you. I make this available for your glory. I want to serve generously with my resources, my words, my resources, and then in a ministry. Every person who's a follower of Jesus should have some ministry they're a part of. It could be a ministry in your home, in seasons of life to your own kids. It could be a ministry in your neighborhood where you're regularly ministering and serving people. It could be a ministry through the local church or out, out in our community, the ends of the earth. But, but if you're a Christian and you want that light to be green on your dashboard, you say, well, there's somewhere I can be serving. 
And I can make this a ri- the rhythm of my life. Find a place to serve like Jesus served. And you know what? Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. He said, well, he didn't wash my feet. He did something far more than that. He took the nails. And he died on a cross. The sinless, perfect Lamb of God took the nails and died. And on the cross, he said, Daddy, where are you? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, Jesus, who had been in perfect union and community with the Father for eternity, somehow in a mystery that we cannot fully understand, the Father turned his back on Jesus because our judgment and our punishment and our payment for our sins was put on Jesus. He did that for us. Has Jesus served you? If you're a Christian, you know he has. If you're not a Christian, I can tell you. When Jesus died on the cross, he was there taking your sins too. All you have to do is receive it, accept that gift. That's the heart of Jesus. And he says, you know, when you become like me, when you follow me closely, you start to serve because I serve. Number five, how do I know I'm getting a grip on my spiritual life? I seek and engage in Christian community more passionately. I love to be together with God's people. In a home, in a church service like this, at a night of worship, in a growth group, you, you, just, you find yourself wanting to come together with other Christians. Yes, we're upward to God. Yes, we're outward to the world, but we also come together. So growing in Christian community, getting in a growth group, or coming to church services, and make, the, make this a rhythm of your life. Now, you're all here today, but, but you know, there's so many things that compete for our time. Weekends, and this, I just want to say a word to parents with little kids. Parents with little kids, watch what we're te- we got to watch what we're teaching our children, the next generation. It used to be that parents, Christian parents would say, listen, being with God's people is so high of a priority, nothing gets in the way. Now our weekends, well, if we can fit church in, we'll get there. But really, uh, if, you know, if, if, you know what, I mean, what, what are some of the biggies that take over our weekends now? Sports, recreation, activities, vacations and being gone elsewhere. If you're somewhere else, go to church there. I, I got a friend who, who lives in Michigan, who also has a house out here, not in this area, but is here today for worship. They're away from home, but they actually found a church to go to, Shoreline Church. When you're traveling, go elsewhere, find a church. Check in advance, and it should be a Christian biblical church, but find a church and go with, gather with God's people. Do you find yourself wanting to and enjoying gathering with God's people more than you have before? Did you have a longing for that, a desire for that? Here's our getting a grip challenge. Make regular worship a part of your life and consider engaging in one other regular time to gather with Christians. I would encourage you to make being here on a Sunday morning or a Monday night service on Monday nights a regular part of the rhythm of your week. Make it a high priority. And if you have kids, teach them that it's a high priority. It's not like, well, if there's nothing else to do, we'll go to church. But man, this is the first thing. And we, we build around this. We're with God's people. We're learning from God's word. This is a good thing. This is where we're supposed to be. But find one other place to connect also. It could be in a growth group. It could be coming to night of worship once a month. It could be in a service opportunity. It could be just some Christians in your neighborhood that you get together with. They're from different churches, but you connect and you have Christian community. There's something good about it. We need to go outward, but we also have to have that time we're together. So if that indicator on, your, on, on the dashboard of your life says, you know, I'm just, I don't really like being with other Christians. I, I avoid it as much as I can. Say, well, is there something wrong? Why is that? Because, because the word of God calls us to gather. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, we read this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. You can't do that unless you're together. To really challenge each other forward. And look at verse 25. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, the day is approaching. Do you know when Jesus is going to return? I do. He's returning one day sooner today than he was yesterday. I know that for sure. What's the actual date? I don't know, and I'll never try to predict because Jesus said, paraphrase, don't do that. Don't try to figure it out. Just live every day like you're ready. But I know this. Today is one day closer than yesterday was. And I know this. We get in the habit of not gathering together. And the word of God says, come together. There's something really good about what happens when you're with God's people. Number six, the final indicator on the dashboard of our lives spiritually. How do I know I'm getting a grip of my spiritual life? 
I help people see Jesus and draw near him more organically, more naturally. We use the term around here, organic outreach. People that are far from Jesus, they, the people that just don't know that God loves them, that they don't know that Jesus died on the cross for them. I care about them. I love them. I want them to know Jesus. I'm not mean. I'm not forceful. I'm not dogmatic. I'm not in your face bugging people. But, but we're loving people. We're inviting people. People know that we love Jesus because we do as part of our lives. How's that going for you? Or is God using you to show others that he's real and he loves them too, just like he loves you? Because he does. He loves them just as much as he loves you, even though they're so far from him. I love in Romans where it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's no one outside the reach of God's love. And there's no one that we can't in some natural way share our love for Jesus and in some way invite them and connect them. There's this great passage in Matthew chapter 9. It's kind of one of my life passages. It says, when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He felt for them because they were harassed and helpless, just like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus, you need to pray. God, send people out into our world to share your love. And who's the first person we should pray for that God will send out? Who's the first person? What's the answer? Ourselves. If you know Jesus, say, God, in some natural way today, let me shine your light and show that you're real. And again, not shoving anything down people's throats, but loving and serving and sharing. You know, do your non-Christian friends, you ready for a radical question? Do your non-Christian friends know that you are a Christian? They should. Not because you wear a certain kind of t-shirt with a stick you know, or a bumper sticker on your car because of the way you live your life because of the words you speak because you share with them about some of the greatest things in your life and guess what jesus is part of that because he's the biggest part of our lives that's the big g god god comes first so are you sharing so here's our getting a grip challenge don't get caught in the christian bubble but be sure you are walking with loving serving and sharing the good news with your friends who don't know the amazing grace of jesus just make sure that in the flow of your life, you're connecting with people who, who still don't know that God loves them. Because Jesus says, you're like salt in this world, creating thirst for the living water of him. And you know, salt in a salt shaker doesn't make anybody thirsty. You shake it out on some popcorn, some chips, something and people start to thirst. God shakes us out and scatters us all over the place. Is it, are you finding that people are drawing towards Jesus because they're around you? That's a green light on the dashboard of your life. You say, man, I will never talk about anything about Jesus with anybody ever. It's just my thing and me and Jesus, nobody else. You go, that, that's kind of a red light because Jesus wants us to have a heart like him. And when he saw people that were far from him, he saw them as harassed and helpless, just like sheep without a shepherd. Our hearts should break for people who don't know this great God who loves them. Honey, I, I'm worried about Billy. He's not walking. He's not even walking. All his friends are walking, and some of them are running. I mean, some are just all over the place. He doesn't even want to stand up. And this light goes off, you know. Something's not right here. We're responsible as followers of Jesus to watch the dashboard of our lives. Am I growing in Christian character more like Jesus? Am I growing to love his word? Am I growing in prayer and worship to communicate with God? Am I, am I serving joyfully, gladly? Am I coming together in Christian community? And am I shining the light of Jesus? Not a spotlight to blind people, just a little candle that glows and draws people from the darkness. And as we do, man, green lights, tanks full, vibrant life of faith. But like I said to you, every one of those lights for me, sometimes goes red. I'm a pastor. I'm just telling you, I'm just being honest. And when I see that, I go, okay, wait a minute, I gotta get this right. How am I gonna do that? Well, all we do here is gonna help you in all six of those areas. So just keep coming, being part of things, and keep your heart open. Check the dashboard. What I wanna do as we close is this. I wanna pray two prayers. One, I wanna pray for people that say, man, one of those lights is kinda red in my life right now, <clears throat> and I wanna say, God, help me address that. 
And then I want to pray for people who that first part of getting a grip, God, maybe you know about God, but you've never really come to the cross and received Jesus. I want to give you a chance to do that. No pressure. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to make you, you know, walk down here. I'm not going to have someone come and take you from your aisle, but I, I want to give you a chance to pray and receive Jesus, become part of his family and start that journey of growth. So let's bow our heads together. And first I want to just ask, if you're here and you've become a Christian at some point along the way, you love Jesus, but you just go, there's, there's at least one of those areas right now. You just kind of thought, I want to grow there. I want to go deeper into God's word. I want to go deeper into prayer. I want to get more passionate about worship. If you would say there's one area of those six that right now you say, I want to grow in that and you, I want to be prayed for. Would you raise your hand, really, keep your heads bowed really high and just, and I'm going to raise both my hands uh, because I want to grow. But you know, if you say, there's an area I want to grow, just raise your hand because I want to see, kind of look at you and I want to pray for you, okay? Just say a lot of hands. And God sees that. He knows that. I think the longer you're a Christian, the more mature you are, the more you realize I've got to grow. But, so you can put your hands down and just join me in prayer. If you raised your hand or if you didn't feel comfortable raising your hand but you want to grow, just let's pray. God, help us notice the dashboard of our spiritual lives. It's so important. When there's red lights, help us to slow down and say, what's going on here? Help us do something to change the way we're living our life of faith. I pray for each person here who's just saying, God, I want to become more like Jesus. I want to go deeper in my spiritual life. I want to get a grip on my spiritual life. Lord, hear their prayers and help them find ways to connect here at Shoreline and in other places, those practices of spiritual growth that will grow them. Lord, hear our prayer. We want to be more like Jesus. We want to love him more and look more like him. We want the world to see that you're alive because you're alive in us. So grow us spiritually. And then if you're here today, and you've never received Jesus. I mean, you've been around church, you might have heard about Jesus, but you've never come to the cross and said, I'm sorry for my sins. I received Jesus to forgive me and help me have a new life. And you want to start this journey of growing in faith. If that's you today, I want you to raise your hand and I want you to raise your hand so that I, and then look up at me so I can actually see you and acknowledge you. So I'm going to see you right here. Okay, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, okay? Thank you. Okay, over here, I'm going to pray for you. Okay, so you can, so I say that, you can put your hand down. Good. Anybody else? Up in the balcony here. Okay, look up at me. There's one, two, three people all in the same area, right down the left side of the right there. All three of you, I want to pray for you. Is there anybody else? Okay, up there. Good, I see you right by the sound booth there, up there. Anybody else? Okay, the little girl over here. I see you. Good, great, thank you. And right back here in the back row. Thank you. Okay, I want to pray for you, all right? Anybody else? And I'll tell you something. If I don't see your hand or if you don't feel... Okay, okay, two right here in the very front of the balcony over here. Good, thank you. Oh, three. Okay, right there. Good, thank you. Um, all right. And if I didn't see your hand, God sees your hand. And if you didn't raise your hand, God could hear your prayer. Would you pray this prayer with me? If you raise your hand, if you want to enter a relationship with Jesus, say, dear God, just quiet in your heart, say, dear God, I want to know your love. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. I admit that I've done lots of wrong things and thought wrong things and said wrong things. I confess my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. Wash me clean. Give me new life. Let the price that you paid on the cross become the price that pays for my sins. Help me live for you. Help me follow you. Help me grow in faith all the days of my life. And Lord Jesus, for all of us, we thank you for the privilege of being together like this. We pray that we would see the Christian life not as a one-moment decision, but as a lifelong journey of growth. Bless each person gathered here. And Lord, for anyone who said, I'm not a Christian, I'm not quite there yet, just let them know that they are loved by you and they're so welcome here. And they can take their own time on their journey of knowing who you are, Jesus. Thank you for an amazing time of worship. Thank you that, that you're helping us get a grip on every area of our lives. Grow us in faith. With each passing day, we pray this, Jesus, for your glory. Amen.